got one amen and one hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I tell you what, when you get to heaven, I'm going to praise you forever. Hallelujah. You heard me saying on earth that all hell breaks loose. I want to tell you, when we get into the presence of Jesus, all oh, heaven is going to break loose. Hallelujah. I know I heard some silly, the young ones are, forget, oh yeah, Irene is out there waiting for you. Young man, if you want to go yeah. out, or you want to stay in? <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. What was I saying then? Yeah, some of the things we say. You know, anyway, forget that. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, we're back in the book of Philippians. Uh, we're going to move on to chapter 2 today. Last week, very quick recap. I'm not going to go through every part. I'll just... Uh, we, we looked at the habits of joyful living. Um, we talked about the Christian life. It's a joy. It should be a joy for us. If you're labouring as a Christian... To believe, to enjoy your faith. There's something wrong. Yeah. The Bible said the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy. And just thinking of what Denise has just shared. You know, it's in them situations. It's in them hard times and tough times. Yeah. And times we don't feel like praying. We don't feel like saying. Yeah. That's where we have to do it. We, we called it the habits of joyful living. A habit is something you have to practice. Amen? Amen. Some of you got bad habits and you really practice them. <laughs> they didn't just happen. You didn't wake up one day with a bad habit. Amen. No. Amen. I remember teaching uh, uh, many years ago in the classes uh, and um, the purpose driven life. Do you remember that? Amen. Yeah. And he said, he said it takes 21 days to break a habit Amen. and 21 days to form a new habit. Amen. Because what most of us try and break a habit, but don't try and replace it and it leaves a vacuum. Yeah. Amen. It's the same in the natural. You know, we all, how many know at New Year? We always make New Year's resolutions. And we've all got good intentions, but we don't. Put it into practice. Yeah. Anyway, we looked at the habits of joyful living. We, we said number one was that uh, we need to look at life from God's perspective. We don't listen to what the world says. Shouldn't do. We, we believe what God says. A lot of people, are, I, I, I suppose I've felt the pressure myself sometimes. And you have to resist it. But we have to go back to the word. Amen. Doesn't matter what they're saying. Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what wars are breaking out. Doesn't we know that if, if you know your Bible, you, you read the end times, we know that we're the winners. Amen. Come on. Amen. Read the end of the book. Amen. Christ is going to come back victorious. Yes. Amen. So we have to look at our situation from God's perspective. What does he say about it? Mm. Then we, we, we said number two was... Where's it gone? We looked at the good guys. We looked at four kinds, sorry. We, let me backtrack there. We said it's looking at it from God's perspective. Mm. And then number two was, don't let others control your attitude. Because mm. people will, won't they? Yes. Amen. You remember I said the other week we was over in the lakes and we went to this little tourist thing and my, I was really tried there mm. because of the city, you know, I, I, I went, lovely day like this and parked up and had our breakfast and come out and it was the end of a, 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 a short week and we just went for a few days and we was all set to come home and Denise said, I'll just knit downstairs and go into the tourist shop before we go. I said, I'll bring the car up. Only to find it was blocked by two cars. One like that and one like that. I couldn't get out. I, I thought, I'll go across the weeds, but there was, there was um, stumps of trees there. And I thought, 
Uh, anyway, I went back, and, as you know, I went back and into the cafe and I said, there's only two tables, uh, people at two tables. Has anybody got a cat? No, no, no. So the woman said to me, is it in the far corner? It's them downstairs. You know, and anyway, you know the story. I could have, I could have easily <laughs> said the wrong things. <laughs> Number one, Denise was there, so I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I still told her. Thank you, Lord. In the best, well, it wasn't a nice way, but it was my nice way. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't allow her to dictate our attitude. We left there and we got on with it and we said, right. Because sometimes it can, can't it? You can go out. Meaning well, having a good day, and something happens, someone says something, an incident happens, and blah, blah, blah. So don't let <coughs> others control your attitude. Yeah. Mm. And then what else did we look at last week? We looked at the killjoys, didn't we? Yeah. Pain, petty people, pressures, and problems. I'm just trying to recap, I don't know how much to share. And so we, we picked it up last week and we talked about focusing on our purpose and not our problems. Yes. What did we say about focusing? Mm. Have you used the magnifying glass? Yeah. And what happens? It enlarges your focus on it. No, man. If you dwell on it, if you dwell on it too much. Yeah, good. You see, yeah. he was listening. Amen. Yeah. Well, no, you was. Well, yeah. You're not talking. Well, I've all been on guilty for that. Well, no, no, you're not guilty. It's fine. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, so we looked at trying not to developing the habits. <laughs> Amen. Of a joyous life. Amen. Now, it might seem a little bit crazy. I'll get through as much as I can today. And. I want to jump into Philippians chapter 2. We've got 11 verses there. Verse 1 through 11. We can read together. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if, excuse me, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Amen. Let each of us. Let each of you look, excuse me, I'm going cross eyed here. Let each of you look out for not only for yourselves or his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Wow, Jesus, the name which is above every name verse 10 says that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and lastly verse 11 and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father that's a powerful portion of scripture yeah, yeah, amen. Yeah. you know if you can meditate on it think about what he's saying And it'll blow any cultish doctrine out of the water. And Jesus came in the form of a man. Amen. Mm. 
So I want to call this today the humble path to joy. The humble path to joy. See, if you were asked, what is the path of happiness? If you were out on the street, maybe you we are witnessing or you're talking or you're sat in, 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 in a, sh a coffee shop and someone come to you and said what is the path of happiness? What would you say? What do you think your, what makes you happy? Remember we've talked in the last few weeks that happiness is different than joy. Yeah. I wonder what most people would say. I know what a lot of people would say. Education. Yeah. Job satisfaction, job job security. Yeah. A good marriage. Maybe. Good health. But that's, as we've learned the last few weeks, the path to joy isn't just the accumulation of things. But it's the path of humility. Hallelujah, Jesus. We said about the four kill joys, which is petty people, pressures and problems, conflict. Conflict is always a kill joy, isn't it? Whether it's in relationships, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's in church, it's a kill joy. But we learned last week that true and lasting joy is willing to deal with conflict. Amen. You ever had conflict in your life? Amen. Are you experiencing conflict now in some situation? You see, I've learned this, and not from experience, but from others, because we all have, or we can all have, let me say, we, we can have all the money in the world. Yes. We can have fame, we can have fortune, we can have success, we can have power. But if we have conflict... But it don't fill in all, does it, all in things, yeah. In our relationships, how many know, if you've got conflict in relationships on whatever level, marriage, work, church, makes life miserable, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Have you ever had conflict with someone in church? Amen. You don't want to. You get up on a Sunday and, oh, could do without it. Amen. Be honest with yourself today. Mm. Makes you miserable. I hope they don't say out to me. I hope don't, they don't sit near me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some laughs there. Zillion times. <laughs> <time. laughs> That's what God said to Sarah. <laughs> My laugh is in your heart. <laughs> But you see, today, I believe humility is the key to reduce conflict. Because yeah. pride is one of the um, primary <coughs> things that causes it. <coughs> pride, did you know that? Amen. Who does she think she's talking to? Who does he think he is? Come on, we've all done it, we've all said it. Mm. Well, that's it, I'm not going. I'm not giving. I'm not the one to say. I'm not going on the coach trip. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Strikes a card all too familiar. Yes. <laughs> it, it's all a result of pride. The Bible says that pride always leads to arguments. Amen. In Proverbs thirteen ten, it tells us that humility. Well, it tells us pride, pride is all, uh, leads to arguments, but humility leads to harmony and joy. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I, I've been in situations of conflict. Some lasted longer than others. Some hurt longer than others. Amen. But it took a time to come to a point in my own life and humble myself and say, I forgive them, I'm going to carry on. See, we've been taught through life and experience to forgive someone, you have to go and, you know, if, if that's what you need to do, go to them. The Bible does say that, but it's not about believers. Mm -hmm. 
You know, be careful of some unbelievers. You don't confront them. But it takes humility to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Because sometimes if I didn't have the reaction I did, it wouldn't have escalated. And now, it, you know, now we're pride, you know. <laughs> They'll be first to come, not me. I'm right, so I'm justified in my stance, and they're the ones that are wrong. It does happen, doesn't it? Mm. All too often. In verse 2 of our, uh, chapter 2, it says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Another translation puts it this way. Make my joy complete. Mm. Have you ever been in, into a situation that it's handbags at dawn? <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll say sorry before me. And it, 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 sometimes it can last for years. Sometimes people never speak. But if you've ever been in that situation, and you're the, even if they do it and they come to you and say, I'm sorry the way I spoke to you, guess what? Just like the shutters on the front door, all your defences come down, don't they? Yeah. Or if you go to them who've been so hard against you and you say, look, can we start over again? I'm really sorry, I, I reacted wrong. Now that takes humility to say that, because inside you're thinking, you're the one I'm not wrong. But you're doing it, Amen. and guess what? They just melt, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. There is some hard, hard, hard cases, but yeah. most of the time, it just melts. Because yeah. humility does away with conflict. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. It tells us there, it says, you know, there's four kinds of relational unity. It says, have the same mind. Think about that, the same mind. You usually get this in uh, relationships, in marriages. You get so used to one another, you know how each other thinks. You've got the same mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, she likes this, or she, he likes that, or we go here, or we go there. And, and, and we become like each other, don't we? The same mind, it's a mental harmony. Yeah, it's like meeting me soul almost. Yeah. Paul said, the same love. That speaks of emotional harmony. The same spirit, spiritual harmony. The same purpose, that's directional harmony. <coughs> that's what the Bible speaks about. Having the same mind. There's nothing greater than being in a situation, especially if we're talking about church congregation. Yeah. Even and it can come right down to your marriage, to your family relationships, your work, whatever relationships. To be of the same mind and the same spirit and the same love. See, but if we're in the flesh, we say. If you love me, I'll love you. Come on. Yeah. It's very hard to love someone who doesn't love you. Mm. Yeah. But the Bible commands us that we to show the love of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the Bible says God first loved us. Amen. Yeah. If he waited for us to say we love you, God, we'd still be waiting now. But God took the initiative and he come and he said, God shall love the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, yes. John 3 16. Yeah. Mm. And so we're saying, I'm born again, I've got the nature of God dwelling in me. Mm. I've got his DNA now, he's my father in heaven. Yeah. I should be acting like him. Yeah. I should be acting like I've got love. I should be acting that I agree with what God says. 
So there's four habits I want to look at of humility. Habit number one is don't let your pride be your guide. Because we'll make mistakes. Did you know the Bible says pride is the root of every sin? And so it doesn't surprise us this morning that every conflict we go through has an element of pride mixed in it. One man said, pride, crime and sin. The centre of every one of them is I. I hope you remember this. As putting them together, I'm thinking of you. Pride, crime and sin is the centre of all of them is I. Verse 3 tells us of our text. Do not do anything from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Or it says let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Just that rule in itself is going to change the whole situation. Amen. Listen, just to forgive someone, just to put your pride aside. How many know to forgive someone? You don't have to live in the pocket. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I've forgiven people I've never seen for 30 years. Yeah, true. I probably won't see them until I get in glory. Completely different. But thing. guess what happened? When I forgive them, I release me. Mm. That's right. The bitterness couldn't grow, the unforgiveness couldn't grow. And it's something genuine. Don't just, you know, make it a cliche. Oh, I forgive them or we'll carry on being bitter and unforgiving. Mm-hmm. That's pride. It's going to take humility. I've had people come up to me in different situations and say, you know when you said such? I said, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> You've held it all that time. And I've not even thought about it. I've not even thought I I said something to offend you. You could have released yourself 25 years ago if we dealt with it then. (coughs) Don't let pride be your guide. Seek selfish ambition. That's what it says. The New Living Translation. Do not... Do anything from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Selfish ambition, what's that? It's all about me. Remember we we learned last week, James 3.16, wherever there is jealousy or selfish ambition, you'll find confusion and every kind of evil. I've seen churches go down. Good churches. We were in one one time and it was booming. 350 people. No, I wasn't passing it, I was in it. 350 people in probably 18 months came to the church. But I want to tell you something because of pride, because of selfish ambition, because people were running for titles and everything, that 350 went down faster than a, a lead balloon. That's right, that's right. And guess what? That church, it was a local one, not far from here, is no longer in existence. And a lot of people have gone their separate ways with unforgiveness and bitterness. And they're taking it to other congregations. That's why I always think, you know, oh yeah, you're welcome, everyone's welcome. But you've got to, it takes a little bit of time to find out why Christians have left that church and come to yours. And they've brought their baggage with them. Just takes a little bit of time. We do it in love. I'm not saying this in a judgmental way. And the Bible says about vain conceit. What's vain conceit? I'm better than you. <laughs> That's pride, isn't it? Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, he tells us that if you and I live a prideful, self-centered life, it can show up in all kinds of ways that Paul calls it 
the works of the flesh. Yeah. We think we've, you know, no one can tell me, and I'll tell anyone. <laughs> but usually those that say that don't like being told. They tell everybody else, but they don't like it in return. And I'm not saying you should do that. But what I'm saying is it's a manifestation of the works of the flesh, the works of the old nature. Paul said, now the works of the, the flesh, in, chapter, in, in Galatians 5, listen to this, the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, so, there's a whole list of them, sorcery, <coughs> enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Galatians 5.19. Let me put it this way. If you and I want to experience true and lasting joy as a Christian, we've got to have harmony in our relationships. And if we're going to have harmony, we've got to have humility. Proverbs says, 16, 18, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Amen. Listen, you might get away with it this time, but you're not going to get away with it. Not that job, God's judging you, but God's saying, you know, if you go this way, you're going to fall down that cliff. If you carry on that attitude, if you carry on this way, sooner or later you're going to get the, bear the fruits. Because mm. pride goes before destruction Amen. and a hearty spirit before the fall. Amen. If you will humble yourself, if you will come before God and me and, and say, Lord, I'm sorry. How many believe when Jesus died he was a sinless person? Because the Bible says that he died. He didn't sin, never sinned. Amen. Yet he took our punishment upon his body upon the cross. Mm. And he says in verse 5 of our text, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That being in the form of God, some translation says being very God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. You say, look, you know, some people say, oh, he's not God. But Jesus, I didn't consider it robbery to say that I'm equal with God. Amen. But he goes on to say that he laid it down. He found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This was contradiction. A sinless man paid the price for, sinless, uh, for sinful people, me and you. Habit number two. Here's another cliche for you. Be humble or stumble. We're learning that humility provides the foundation of every healthy relationship. If we're humble, we don't want to be, or we don't want to act like the know-it-all. Yeah. Do you any know-it-alls? <laughs> yeah. Are you a know-it-all? No. Some people think I am. <laughs> and when you're not a know-it-all, you treat others with respect, amen? Yeah. And when you treat others with respect, you're literally giving them honour. Verse 2 and 3 of our text says, 
These words, it says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, it's a, it, it's a mentality, of lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And this is the opposite, really, of what the world teaches, isn't it? Because the world teaches, do what's best for you. Who cares? You know, what, one of the things anyone over 50 will say, oh, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't even lock our doors. <laughs> and my brother always helps and says, yeah, because we had now. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't even lock our doors in our days. Yeah. Now, you know, you don't let your neighbour know you're going away. Yeah. And it's a mentality, isn't it, that we've grown up in our communities with. That's what the world says. Do what's best for you. Look out for number one. Live for self. I've seen this happening in the last two years through the lockdowns and, and, and the shortages. Remember... The most hilarious thing was toilet roll shortages. Oh, yeah, your face is lit up then. I bet you were that front of the queue, weren't you? Yeah. I said this, you go to that till and I'll go to it because you've only had one packet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all did, didn't you? Yeah. I said to me, when we were kids, we didn't have toilet rolls. Went straight for the Amsolts. John Bolton Evening News. <laughs> Went straight for the Amsolts, mate. My dad used to rip the newspaper up after he read it, put a piece of string through it, and hang it in the outside toilet. Oh, you never did that. <laughs> It was so embarrassing when we went to school and we went to the gym and the showers. We had the Bolton Evening News printed on our. <laughs> That's an, an old joke. <laughs> Paul the Spurs, he tells us to humble ourselves to the Apostle Paul and give more honour to others than yourselves. Humility is not less of ourselves. Humility is humble, modest. Yes, you have the seat. I'll stand up. Years ago, you know, a lady couldn't get on the bus. A female couldn't get on the bus and stand up when men were sat down. They don't tell me to the ghetto. I saw the clipping and it showed this man he wouldn't get up. A pregnant woman. He said, no, she voted for equality. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> that's the wrong attitude, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the way the world looks at it. Looking after number one. No modesty. <coughs> See, I want to tell you this morning, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It has nothing to do with what you think about yourself, but what we think about other people. Amen. It's not putting ourselves down, but it's building others up. Listen, humility is not devalue, devaluing us. <coughs> it's valuing you more. See, humility this morning is not, de it's not denying our, our um, strengths, but it's being honest about our weaknesses. And that's something we've had to learn in ministry, and you've probably learned it in your life, and in, especially in business life, is surround yourself with people who know more than you. Amen. Yes, amen. amen. It's called teamwork. Don't deny your strengths, but acknowledge your weaknesses. Thank you, Jesus. God promises more in the Bible about humility than weaknesses. 
It talks about if we humble ourselves, what does the Bible say? If you humble yourselves, God will lift you up. Mm -hmm. See, if we humble ourselves, think of others more than ourselves. God promises this, friend. God promises that his presence to you and I, he promises his presence in greater measure. Listen to this in James 4, 6. It says, God opposes the proud. Do you ever think of that when you're being prideful? God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So anytime I'm acting or thinking something in a prideful, arrogant way, I'm on the opposite side of God. I might be right in my theology and in my politics, however, if I'm presenting it in a prideful way, I'm wrong. Amen. Look at our church, look at our organization, Look at our leaders. Look at look at me. God's promise is grace. What do you mean grace? God's grace is, is the ability to forgive. Yes. Grace means God's undeserved kindness. God's unmerited favour. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. It's not because you're good looking. It's undeserved, and God gives it us. For others. Have you ever wanted to forgive, but you don't feel like forgiving? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, grace is the ability to resolve a conflict when I don't feel like it. Grace is the ability, listen to this, grace is the ability to compromise. See, we've been taught compromise is a very negative thing. But you know, when I got married, and this goes for a lot of men, I came from a home where the males did all the Cleaning the grate out, sweeping up. We didn't have a roof of in them days. Sweeping up, doing the garden, any painting or decorating. And the girls in the in the family, they was the ones that did the washing up, they did the laundry, they did all those things. And so my mother used to do it all. You get out of bed, you throw your dirty clothes on the floor, and you'll go off to school. Magically, when you come home, it was all washed and ironed. Never thought of who, who's doing it. Mm. So when you go into a, a marriage relationship, Denise, I can hear Denise in our first year, I'm not your mother. <laughs> come up. Take it your socks. Mm. Some good advice here, Sadie. <laughs> Don't mommy cut <couple. laughs> Be a good housewife, be a good wife. And the first year of conflict <laughs> was learning to compromise. Mm. Learning our roles, helping one another. It's not always been successful in my life, but you know, we try. I'm not trying to say the women do this and the men do that, but we try to work together. I was talking to our granddaughters yesterday, uh, Jessica with the, uh, our grandson, and you know, we, we, Denise was saying, oh, you, you, you're a lovely mother and all this stuff, you know, and uh, her boyfriend is a typical male. He's a hard worker, he works six days a week. When he comes home, he wants his tea, and he wants a burp and watch telly all night. <laughs> Forgetting that she's had that child since 6 a.m., She's watered and fed him, took him to nursery, picked him up, done the tea, done the shopping, done the house cleaning, done all those things, thinking when he comes home, 
He can take over for an hour. Give me a break. But it doesn't happen. It causes conflict, doesn't it? So what happens is we've got to compromise. Yeah. We've got to compromise in church. Yeah. Was it Frank Sinatra who sang that song? I did it my way. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to not do that. We've got to do it God's way. We've got to humble ourselves. Amen. Because if you don't humble, you stumble. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> See, James says these words in uh, John, sorry, chapter 3, 30. He must increase, speaking about Jesus, and I must decrease. That takes humility, doesn't it? That takes you and I humbling ourselves. Number three, very quickly, because time's run away. Number three, Learn the lost art of paying attention. Okay. Your mother or your teacher ever say, Hey, are you listening? <laughs> Pay attention. One man said, We live in a world that suffers from attention deficit disorder. And he says, You know, Especially the younger generation, they have a very short attention span. And it puts it down to all this modern technology. And I remember many years ago when we started off in ministry doing that, um, pioneer work and stuff like that, we used to always show films, gospel films, you know, and we showed them for years. I remember that film, The Cross and the Switchblade. Well, that was out in the seventies, and it was a, it was a, it went down a storm. I've heard of it. But we were still showing it in nineteen eighty-five as an outreach, and the kids used to come in. And I, I, I'll be honest, I looked at them and thought, "This is so seventies. Do you know how you can tell a seventies film? The colour, the colours are so bad." Yeah. The dress code was so ridiculous. <laughs> mm. And they wouldn't come in, they'd say, I can't, I you know. They wanted to go home and go on the on the PlayStation and they wanted to go on the you know Netflix and all that. It Why? Like because because of all the technology now, they've got a very short attention span. Exactly, it's pretty good, I mean, something. Who's in that film, Bill? I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm not I am not i am not a film critic, I don't know. <laughs> You know, my brother, if my brother was here, yeah. he'd tell you every bomb. Yeah. He was in it when it was shown. Yeah, I know of the title. And he was one of them, my older brother, he'd sit behind the settee leaning and telling you the story <laughs> as you're watching it. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Can't watch it now. Oh, he's, I know it, he's going to, John Wayne's going to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Amazing. my> man. <laughs> Learn to... Learn the lost art of paying attention. Amen. Verse 4 of our text says, Let each of you look not to your own interest, but the interest of others. Amen. Amen. You know, listen, that's human nature, isn't it? Dog eat dog, they say. Yes. One man said, I've never seen a dog eat a dog. Where do we get that saying from? The human nature, think about me more than anyone else. That's getting back to what I was saying about the toilet rolls. <laughs> or the shopping. Do you know people was fighting outside Tesco's? For toilet rolls? Yeah. I seen one man with a big trolley and he had it. This side the toilet rolls. Oh, sorry, sorry. What do you mean? I've got, you know, and it was like the place was in uproar. Yeah. Because just thinking about themselves. Yeah. Not realising when we grab all that stuff, because they only have to say it's going short, and everybody goes and empties the shelves. And guess what? It makes it worse. The shortage is worse now. It's called selfishness. Mm -hmm. It's all about me. Hmm. One man said these words, the greatest gift we can give somebody is attention. Because you know what, attention is our time. Give your children attention. Give your family attention. 
Give these church folk attention, because that's going to take time. And time is our most valuable asset. I look now, as I'm approaching, well, I've approached it since the end. <laughs> I've gone past the line. You know, what used to didn't bother me years ago, oh, yeah. As they say in California, mañana. <laughs> Tomorrow will do. Yeah. Well, now it's got to be today. <laughs> Yeah. We might not be here tomorrow. Woo! We don't like to hear that, do we? But none of us are guaranteed the morning. You're not guaranteed it. So let me ask you in the spiritual, how attentive are you and I this morning? Are you interested in only what concerns you? Or do you see others better than yourself? No. no. You can go in that queue and say, you know, the other day, I got lovely joy out of it. Denise, I dropped Denise off here for the, the art class and I said, right, I've got to go back to Little Alton to get my prescription. It's overdue, I have to collect it. I said, while I'm there, it's our Jennifer and Alan's wedding anniversary. I said, I'll, I'll, I've got the card and the present in the car. So on the way up there, I said, I'll leave it in the porch, should be out working. So on the way up there, I pulled in to Aldi's, the big Aldi's at West Thorn. Got a bunch of flowers. Well, the tills were full. This woman, two women in front of me, they must have been shopping for the whole community. <laughs> And they got there with these bunch of flowers. And these two ladies go, oh, them for me. Get in front of us, you've only got them. <laughs> and then the, the thing was full. And this woman said, is that all you've got, love? Get to the front. <laughs> oh, I said, I love you a lot. I said, they're not for my wife, they're for my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I thought, how kind was that? Yeah, yeah, I get that quite a bit. I thought, if that was me, love, you'd be out the back. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's great, isn't it? Thinking of others before you start. I, I, I've run out of time and I'm looking out of them. I'm going to save that for next week. I'll finish with this and I'll pick it up again next week. Habit number four. All you oldies will know this. Ask, what would Jesus do? Remember the bracelets in the 70s, the mother bracelets? WW. WWJD, what would Jesus do? And all the kids used to wear them. You'd say, What's that mean? And you, it was a, a, an opportunity to say, Oh, it's asking what would Jesus do in this situation? We don't really need them bracelets, do we? Because Jesus said, Let this mind be in you. Think, what would Jesus do in this situation? I remember the pastor telling me, not telling me, but telling the congregate uh, the conference. I was over in LA, and uh, the pastor got up and he said, "I remember telling the discipleships in the disciple the males in the discipleship class, flee every form of fornication and such a thing." And, and he preached on this, and he had this big burly Mexican man, truck driver, and he was going through the streets of California, and he said. I was thinking of this message, he might have been listening to it. I was thinking of this message and I got to the traffic lights and there was a, a little convertible car, Mercedes next to me with a, a blonde in it. And she's looking up and giving him the eye. And she's going like that. <laughs> That's old fashioned for the phone. <laughs> and he said, he'd had a box of chocolates for his wife on the seat. <laughs> And he didn't know what to do. He said, the pastor, flee every form of fornication and sin. He said, so I opened the window and I threw the chocolates at her and I drove off. <laughs> what would Jesus do? He probably wouldn't do that. But... <laughs> See, let me pause this. If we find ourselves in the midst 
of a problem or a conflict or a difficult decision, we need to seek to have the same mind that Jesus would have had in that situation. And in that situation or conflict, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Would he kick the dog? Would he kick over the table? Would he storm out and throw a tantrum and slam the door? No. Probably not. I know one time he went into the temple and he, 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 he tore it apart because he was selling and, 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 and using it for usury and stuff like that. And he turned all the money changers' tables over. Said, don't, you know, this is a house of prayer. But well, that wasn't a regular thing. We said, you know, the theologian tells us that was holy anger. But you and I don't get that. We just get angry. <laughs> we can say it was holy anger, but it's usually not. What would Jesus do? I want to leave you with that far, and then we're going to pick it up next week. Can we give Jesus a big hand this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Bring it to our remembrance in times of need. We're going to have some refreshments right now, uh, tea and coffee and biscuits. We encourage you to stay behind.